Okay, so this is another one of those lectures where the lecture might not run super long, but the material is extremely important. So we're going to introduce the idea of a system of differential equations. And then from this point on, this is basically all we'll be studying in this class. So in the vast majority of situations we care about, we're not just looking at one quantity, we're looking at a bunch of quantities. And we want to know how they're changing over time. So like I'm currently doing research with a friend in the business department and we're looking at, you know, skilled wages, wages of skilled workers, I should say, and wages of unskilled workers and employment rates and all that stuff. And we're looking at how those change over time. So we have a bunch of differential equations, but, and this is the significant part, the differential equations interact with each other. You can't look at them each as their own thing. As another example of that, this is a very classic example. We'll look at it later in the course. But to see a system of differential equations in the wild, let's briefly introduce the SIR model. And this is one of the absolute classic Models in differential equations, it's a model of disease dynamics. And when you see the SIR model, it's going to be very simple. But what makes it classic is that it's infinitely modifiable. It's very easy to take the idea behind it and tweak it as need be. But in the, in the classic model, we're dividing a population into groups. We're saying that people can be in one of three groups. First of all, people can be susceptible to a disease. There's a disease out there and people can catch it. Alternatively, people can be infective. You also hear infected, but what I want to emphasize is that this is a contagious disease we're imagining, and people who are sick can make other people sick via contact with them. And let's call the last compartment recovered. Um, you also see a removed. So in this model, people do not get sick from the same disease more than once. Once you're recovered, you're immune to it. And we talk, we look at how people transition between these categories. And in the classic model, 
people can only really move in a very limited number of ways. People who are susceptible can become sick. People who are sick can recover. But as I say, there are sort of an infinite number of um, ways we can modify this. You know, if we want to add a vaccinated category, for example, we can do that. If we want this recovery not to grant full immunity, but to only grant partial immunity, we can let people go from recovered to infective again. So there are all sorts of things we can do with this, but since I'm not primarily lecturing on the model today, I'm lecturing on the idea of having a system. We'll just look at this. And because there are three groups of people, there are three differential equations we can look at. We can look at how the number of susceptible people is changing. We can look at how the number of infective people is changing. We can look at how the number of removed people is changing. So the number of susceptible people in this model can only decrease. Once somebody's become sick, they can recover, but they can't be susceptible again. And here's the equation. And we're going to see equations that look like this a lot in a variety of contexts. The spread of disease, but also in predator-prey models and in models of armed conflict, where we've got variables being multiplied by each other. Susceptible times infective. And we see terms that look like this. When interactions between the compartments are driving the model. So here, how does somebody get sick? Well, an infective person interacts with a susceptible person. So that interaction drives the model. In predator-prey dynamics, how do animals get eaten? Well, predators interact with prey. In models of armed conflict, how do people die? Well, opposing militaries interact with each other. So when you see a term that looks like this, it's suggesting that interactions between these groups are driving the model. How many people, or rather at what rate, are people becoming infective? Well, in this model, people who stop being susceptible become infective. So that's why you see the same term repeated twice, once with a positive sign, once with a negative sign. Um, everyone who leaves S enters R. But people are also able to leave the infective category by recovering. And again, it's a little by the by, and we'll talk about this more when we actually get to the SIR model. 
But this is another thing. You see a lot in differential equations where there's a negative term um, multiplied by a constant. And what this is getting at is how many people are recovering? Well, people can't recover unless they're already sick. So the more infective people there are, the more people are recovering. And you see that again in like models of armed conflict. A military can't sustain losses unless there are people in the army who can be killed. So the bigger an army is, the more losses they're going to sustain. An animal population can't be eaten unless there are animals to eat. So the bigger a prey species is, the more that prey species gets eaten. And here, somebody can't recover unless they're sick. So the more infective people there are, the more people are recovering. It can be a kind of unintuitive idea. Because, I mean, you think, you know, if there are a bunch of infective people, the disease is prevalent, and you sort of, your intuition maybe says, well, that means there aren't a lot of people recovering because the disease is everywhere. Actually, the opposite is true. And then, how many people recover? Well, the only way to become recovered is to leave the infective category. So, just like these terms are the same, those terms are the same. So, these are differential equations. This is a system of three differential equations. Um, and the important observation here is that you have three differential equations, but let me sort of remove the visual clutter. You have three differential equations, but you can't study them in isolation. Like, suppose you want to study this differential equation. You want to understand how the susceptibles are changing. Well, this differential equation has an I in it. So if we want to understand this first differential equation, we need to understand this second differential equation. But the second differential equation has an S in it. So before we can understand the second differential equation, we have to understand the first one. It's um, circular. So we can't just look at S because to understand S, we need to look at I. We can't just look at I, because to understand I, we have to look at S. If we're going to study the SIR model, we can't think of it as three different differential equations. We have to think of it as a single group where we study all of the equations simultaneously. And that's the idea of a system of differential equations. And again, another reason why I didn't want to spend a huge amount of time looking at tricks for solving individual differential equations, because that's not what you are looking at in most real world situations. In most real world situations, you're looking at systems like this. 
So we wanted to introduce the concept today. And we want to introduce the idea of reduction of order. And reduction of order is one of those things where sort of the way that Shadron State College works is kind of fighting the textbook. You know, if I were at like, if we were at, you know, the University of Cincinnati and we were in a differential equations course, most of the students there would be engineers. And those engineers would use reduction of order in their engineering classes. Because we can't we lack that at Shadron State. Reduction of order is one of those things where we'll talk about it for a section and then never talk about it again. And it, that's kind of underselling how important important it is in a lot of real world contexts. Um, and the idea of reduction of order is to take a system of high order differential equations and rewrite it as a system of lower order differential equations. And the reason we do that is that we can, it's easy to numerically solve lower order differential equations using Euler's method or something like it. Now I'm going to present reduction of order with an example. Reduction of order requires you to have differential equations that look like this where you can take the highest order differential equation and write it in terms of the lower order derivatives. So this is as opposed to something like the third derivative of x plus the sine of t times the third derivative of x equals x double prime. You cannot reduce the order here because there is no way to get the third derivative by itself on the left-hand side. So this reduction of order process we're going to introduce doesn't always work. It really requires that the highest order derivative only appear once and that it not be trapped in a sign or an exponential or a natural logarithm or anything like that. And I'm going to introduce the idea of reduction of order with an example. Because I think talking about specific examples is usually easier than trying to do stuff in total generality. So even though we're in the chapter on systems of differential equations, we'll start with just one differential equation. X double prime equals 82 times the cosine of 4t minus 2x prime 
minus 26x. So what we're going to do here is we're going to define some new variables. We're going to define a variable x1 and x1 will just be x. Then we'll define a variable x2 and x2 will be x prime, the first derivative of x. Then we'll define a variable x3. And x3 will be x double prime, the second derivative of x. And now that we've defined as many variables as we have derivatives, we'll stop. We don't need to define x4 to be the third derivative of x because there are no third derivative terms up here. And now we're going to turn this into a system of differential equations, a system of first order differential equations, x sub one prime equals x prime. x sub two prime equals x double prime. I don't think we had x sub three prime equals x triple prime. So we're just taking the derivative of each of these and taking derivatives means adding a prime. So x sub one prime is x prime. But x prime is x sub two. x sub two prime is x double prime. x double prime is x sub three, but more to the point, x double prime is that. 82 times the cosine of 40 minus 2x prime minus 26x. And x3 prime, we do not actually need. I always do a little unnecessary work because I always forget that you can stop with some um, Well, here we are. Um, we did not really need x sub three equals x double prime. I always write it because I never totally remember that we don't need it until the end of the problem. And now we have not finished, but we're getting there. X1 prime equals X2. X2 prime equals 82 times the cosine of 40 minus 2X prime. 
Well, fortunately, we know what x prime is. x prime is x sub 2. So minus 2, x sub 2, minus 26x. Again, we know what x is. x is x1. So now we are done. Now, the second order differential equation has turned into a system of first order differential equations. And you might think that you've lost out on this. I mean, your instinct is probably to believe that having a system is worse than having a single equation. In reality, though, you're not going to be solving these by hand in the real world. You're going to be telling a computer to do it. And your computer can, um, you know, Wolfram Alpha or MATLAB or whatever you're using. Um, it's going to be able to deal with a system of first order equations very easily. So we, like MATLAB has something like 20 different methods for solving a system like this hard-coded into it. On the other hand, we don't have a general method for solving a higher order equation like that. So... The purpose of this method is to replace high order differential equations. Let me just say MATLAB, because that was what we had at Ohio University. MATLAB cannot deal with those, or at least it can't deal with them easily, with a system of first order differential equations where MATLAB can solve these Easily. And I'm name dropping MATLAB just because it's the computer algebra system I have the most experience with. But this is true in general. Like I mentioned that I was doing research with Dr. McCarthy in the business department. We're not using MATLAB, we're using Python packages, but we run into the same thing. Our Python packages don't like having higher order systems or higher order equations. On the other hand, they don't care at all if we have a bunch of first order equations. So, again, we see this maybe kind of unintuitive thing that there are cases where we'd rather have a bunch of differential equations than we would a single differential equation. And 
And this was um, let's now take this idea and generalize it. Let's maybe x double prime is t cubed minus 3x prime minus 4x plus 2y and y triple prime is 2x plus 3xy prime plus x prime, y prime, plus the cosine of t. And so to make sure we're on the same page here, when you see something like this, here x and y are both dependent variables. You know, in cottage algebra, you have this intuition that X and Y are different. In the first few chapters of this course, we retain that intuition. Now we're going to jettison it. Here are independent variables T, Everything else is a dependent variable. So X and Y are playing the same role as here. So this can become a little tedious, but it's going to be a very similar process to what we did here. We're going to define new variables. Each of the new variables we define is going to be a derivative. Well, and also just the variable itself. X1 equals X. X2 equals X prime. X3, we don't truly need, but x3 could equal x double prime. Then y1 can be y. y2 can be y prime. y3 can be y double prime, y4 can be y triple prime. And now we're going to take some derivatives. X one prime equals X prime. X two prime equals X double prime. Y one prime equals Y prime. Y two prime is y double prime, y3 prime is y quadruple prime. And what we're now going to do is um, get rid of those x's and y's and replace them with x1s, x2s, y1s, y2s, and y3s. So x1 prime equals x prime equals x sub 2. x2 prime equals x double prime, 
which is up here. And for the moment, I'll just copy this down. However, this x prime and this x and this y have got to go. Y one prime equals Y prime, which is Y sub two. Y two prime is Y double prime, which is Y sub three. Y sub three prime is Y triple prime, which again, I'll copy But we've got to do something because because our variables are now x1, x2, y1, y2, y3. So that x and that x and that y prime and that x prime and that y prime all have to go. And now it's just like doing a cipher. You've got your key over on the left. Um, let's see. This X has got to go. Well, X is X sub one. So everywhere an X appears, we replace it with an X sub one. That Y prime has got to go. <laughs> well, that Y prime is Y sub two. So every time a Y prime shows up, you replace it with a Y sub two. That X prime has got to go. Now well, X prime is X sub two. So everywhere an X sub two shows up, you replace it, sorry, everywhere an X prime shows up, you replace it with X sub two. And finally, let's see, what have I, What have I circled but not replaced? This Y has got to go. Well, Y is Y sub one. And that is reduction of order. And slightly a, a slightly short lesson today, but we finished the section, and I will therefore call it. Uh, any questions? I think I'm good. All right, sounds good. So no please, if anything does come up in the homework, you can just send me an email.